uh, let's go ahead and get started in, in, uh, in respect of everyone's time. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, and welcome. Thank you for joining the second in a series of webinars brought to you by BioSerenity Smart Healthcare Solutions. During today's presentation, we encourage you to ask questions through the comments portal that is uh, located on your screen. Our webinar today is titled Bridging the Healthcare Gap with our two distinguished guest speakers. Our first speaker will be Professor Martin Brody. He is president of the International Bureau of Epilepsy or IBE. He qualified in medicine at Glasgow University and undertook his postgraduate training in London before returning to Glasgow where he directed the epilepsy unit in Glasgow, Scotland from 1981 providing a range of services for people with seizure disorders across the west of Scotland. He set up and chairs the board of trustees of charity, Scottish Ep Epilepsy Initiative. Martin Brody's research interests include anti-epileptic drug neuropharmacology, randomized clinical trials, prognostic outcome studies, pharmacological management of epilepsy, and factors affecting anti-epileptic drug response. He has published more than 500 editorials, chapters, reviews, proceedings, and scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals. Martin Brody was secretary and then chair of the International League Against Epilepsy, or ILAE, Commission on European Affairs from 1993 until 2001, and treasurer of the ILAE from 2005 through 2009, having previously been vice president from 2001. He was given the IBE, ILAE, Ambassador for Epilepsy Award in 1995, and has subsequently received the European Epileptology Award from the ILAE Commission on European Affairs, the, Ep the Epilepsy Lifetime Service Award from its UK chapter, and the William G. Lennox Award from the American Epilepsy Society, and a Lifetime Accelerator Award from the Epilepsy Foundation in the USA. Our second speaker will be Dr. Bruce Lavin. He is the Chief Medical Officer of BioSerenity. His role is Head of BioSerenity Research Unit, which includes clinical research, clinical applications of technology, data generation and dissemination, scientific engagement, and clinical innovations. He is also Adjunct Professor of Biomedical Science at Georgia State University and a practicing physician in internal medicine, infectious disease, and critical care. Bruce has over 35 years of clinical medicine practice and academic medicine experience, including over 20 years of research and development experience in the biopharma industry. Bruce has held various executive level scientific positions in the pharmaceutical industry and several clinical positions at academic medical centers, working in clinical development and medical affairs leadership roles. Bruce earned his doctorate of medicine degree from the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences and served as a medical officer and medical division head in the US Navy, retiring as a Navy captain after 37 years of service. He has also earned a Master of Public Health degree in Health Policy and Administration from UCLA. Bruce also attended the American University Western College of Law for his first degree, first year of law studies. And with that, I would like to uh, pass it over to Professor Martin Brody. Professor Brody. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm speaking to you <clears throat> from a very wet and windy Scotland, just outside of Glasgow. You can see Glasgow on my map. Uh, I'm a Scottish nationalist, so I've managed to get rid of England altogether, but I'm afraid in real life that's going to take a lot longer. What I'm going to do today is just give you a summary of the state of the art of treatment of epilepsy. Have we moved forward? <clears throat> and that includes not just drugs, but also other uh, modalities of treatment, including surgery. Slides won't move. Slides, Slides won't, won't move. Nope. They moved before. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry for the short delay. These are a few of my de declarations of interest. Next slide. And these are the drugs <clears throat> that I've been involved with over the last 30 plus years. And there are many, of course, who never, never even reached the marketplace. And down at the bottom are some of the newer agents that we're currently uh, studying, such as Cimabamate. At the beginning, of course, was potassium bromide. And uh, in this paper in 1857, 52 cases of epilepsy treated with potassium bromide were discussed. You, you might ask, why do, I, why do I talk to you about potassium bromide? Well, I have a particular interest in potassium bromide. Next. Because bromide, this, comes out to M. Brody. And uh, I didn't know that when I became an epileptologist, but I'm quite pleased about it now. I don't think anybody else can, can do a trick quite like that. Next slide. What I'm going to talk to you about is what we have achieved over the last 30 years with the medication, and then a little bit about, about surgery and devices. And I start at the beginning with patients with newly diagnosed epilepsy and follow them up for as long as they continue to come to my clinic and often beyond. So the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The journey to refractory epilepsy, of course, begins with a single seizure. Next slide. <clears throat> this uh, data, the first set of data we generated was published in 2000 in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it looked at how do patients get refractory epilepsy? Uh, what factors are associated and how many don't get refractory epilepsy? And I've been following up my series of patients ever since uh, then, and I'll show you the latest data in a minute. Next slide. <clears throat> the first set had 64% of patients seizure-free, mostly on one anti-epileptic drug, usually the first, but some on multiple. And then, as you can see, things seem to be getting a little bit better, 64.4% uh, with the second analysis of 788, uh, 780 patients, 68.4% uh, with the third analysis. And I'm going to leave you a little bit in suspense before I tell you what the latest numbers are of the 1795. Next slide. The first slide <coughs> is very important because it really points the way to what happens next. 47% of these 470 patients responded to their first drug and became seizure-free. 13% responded to a second schedule. And only 4% after that became, subsequently became seizure-free. So the first two treatments really make the biggest difference. Among patients who did not respond to the first drug, the percentage who subsequently became seizure-free was smaller when failure was due to lack of efficacy, 11%. They're due to intolerable side effects, 41%, or idiosyncratic reactions, 55%. So by failing a decent dose of your first drug, that often tells the doctor that this is going to be a very difficult epilepsy to, to control. Next slide. The next database I want to share with you is 198 adolescent and adult patients starting on their first drug between 82 and 2005. Again, uh, many in long-term follow-up with a minimum of at least two years. Next slide. What we were able to see here were a number of patterns. First pattern was those patients who became seizure-free within six months of starting treatment and continued throughout follow-up uh, seizure-free long-term. And that's 37%. Another group of patients, next slide, did well <clears throat> and they had a delayed response, but once we got the, the drug right and the dose right, they also became seizure-free. So that's about 60% who do really well and we get them seizure-free uh, long-term. 15% or so, 17% had fluctuations of seizure freedom and recurrences. Sometimes they were seizure-free for a number of years, sometimes they were uh, having seizures for a number of years, and they never really settled. The last group was 25% or so who never completed any 12-month seizure-free period. We might have reduced the number of, of seizures to somewhat. Uh, we might have got rid of some of the tonic-clonic seizures, but we never made them seizure-free. <clears throat> and in order to improve quality of life, we need to make somebody seizure-free. Having some seizures doesn't do it, doesn't do the trick. Next slide. So we can really divide 
the population of patients with epilepsy into two groups. Those that are seizure-free long-term and those who are going to be refractory long-term, with some in the middle remitting and relaxing. And we can figure that out often, certainly for the first two groups, fairly quickly. Next slide. <clears throat> so overall, if you look at different sets of, of data, this is a, a, a data set from Scandinavia of kids, <clears throat> median age of seven years, 600 followed up long term, 59% seizure free, very similar to my original number I showed you, 30% drug resistant and 11% relapsing remitting. So very similar to what, what I found and I'm going to show you the updated version of my data set uh, very soon. Next. So if we, that's children, if we look at old age, the older the population, the more likely you are to make them seizure free. <clears throat> and uh, you could say, well, maybe uh, the seizures weren't epilepsy, and there's a lot of discussion about that. But in all the publications, they all show the same pattern. So as you become older, your chances of, of having refractory epilepsy actually get less, and the chances of being uh, controlled get, get, get more. Next slide. So when we've just uh, looked at 201 elderly patients, or older patients from the ages of 65 to 93, uh, and uh, the mean duration of follow-up was 7.5 years. So some were followed up for a few years, some were followed up for 20, 30 years. And we have 79% remaining seizure-free, mostly on monotherapy, with just five uh, controlling on, on more than one drug, uh, always two drugs. So these, these patients do better, uh, and uh, that is a, a different lecture, another, another discussion. Next slide. However, as time goes on, as you'd appreciate, the, the, the patients will relapse and seizures will recur. And in this analysis, where we looked up to 10 years in, in the cohort of 188, compared to the first year in the cohort of 749, we've gone from 68% seizure-free to 52%. Because after all, we're treating seizures, we're not treating epilepsy. These are anti-seizure drugs, they're not anti-epilepsy drugs. Next slide. This is the last analysis, the, the final analysis, which we published the, the, one of the papers just this year, and I'll show you the data. And this was 1,795 eligible patients, all again followed up for at least two years, and many for much more than that. And, and we wanted to see what was the seizure freedom rate at the time of analysis and what were the side effects, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. What we were able to show in the, in the, in, in the analysis was that we changed practice, clinical practice. So we didn't just stick with carbamazepine and phenytoin. We, didn't, we, we stopped using them. And we, we, started, we started to use lamotrigine. We started to lose levetiracetam. We started to use a lot of lacosamide. So we changed our clinical practice. Valprate, of course, still stays there because although there are big issues related to the teratogenicity, it is a very effective drug, particularly for primary generalized epilepsy. So we still have some Valprate there. Next slide. So this was what happened, the possibility of seizure freedom in the first cohort of patients with newly diagnosed epilepsy studied between 82 and 91. And you can see a nice curve. Next slide. Now, if you then look at 92 to 2001 and add in the extra patients, now 826, what have you got? Well, you've got a similar curve. Now, if I tell you then, when we start looking at the patients who get the most modern drugs, what do you think you're going to find? Next slide. Absolutely the same. So <clears throat> absolutely no difference in terms of all the new additional drugs <clears throat> to the probability of overall long-term seizure freedom. These are anti-seizure drugs. Next slide. When we looked at the side effects, we saw something similar. If anything, there were more side effects in the last, last group when we had the new drugs. And the reason is obvious because we've got lots of patients who are going to be seizure free on a, on a low dose of drugs, uh, of any drug, and, and they are not going to have side effects. We're going to have a group of patients, 25%, who are never seizure free. So they get more than one drug and they get high doses. And so they do get side effects and it doesn't change the, 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 depending on what drugs they, they take. So the newer drugs and the older drugs in clinical practice are just as effective and just as well tolerated. Next slide. 
when we look at the tolerability rates, <coughs> they aren't any different. And this is intolerability for the first group, the second group, and the third epoch. And the prescription of new of newer anti-seizure drugs, 22% in the first epoch, 68.7% in the second, uh, in the third epoch. Again, supporting the situation that I've already outlined to you, that we really haven't done a great deal in terms of long-term outcome uh, with the anti-seizure drugs that I've had over the last 30 years. Next slide. So when we look at <coughs> this chart here, which has patients who are seizure-free on the first regimen, second regimen, third regimen, fourth regimen, etc., and those who are uncontrolled, you will see that from the first analysis of 470, 470 patients and the, and the last analysis of 1,795 patients, they're identical. So if you switch them, uh, <coughs> there wouldn't be any difference. So that is proof positive that we really haven't made a huge difference to outcome in, in, in the common epilepsies affecting adolescents and adults in everyday clinical practice. Next slide. What we do know, of course, is that the more drugs you try, the more likely you are to get seizure-free, but very few with the, uh, with the fourth or fifth or sixth schedule. Uh, as you can see here, 50% with the first schedule seizure-free, 11% with the second, and then very few after that. However, not everybody does get a second schedule or a third schedule or a fifth schedule or a sixth schedule. So when you actually look at the patients, you break it down to those patients who get those different schedules. Next slide. <clears throat> You'll see that it doesn't look quite so bad. So patients who had a third schedule, 24% were seizure-free. Patients who had a fourth schedule, 15% were seizure-free. Fifth, 14%. Sixth, 14%. So again, as long as you don't poison the patient by having two higher dose, if you do persevere, you will get some patient seizure free on the fourth, fifth, or sixth uh, schedule. And this is an important lesson to learn uh, from this data set. Next. So <laughs> what's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is that after uh, 30 years, um, seizure freedom rate 64% in 97 and 64% in 2014, 2016. 470 versus 1795. What is different is that we have more patients on polytherapy. And so that some were relaxing and you could get them back with more than one drug. But the overall outcome is no different. And so I'm not suggesting that for every patient that's the case, but certainly for the population, it certainly is. Next slide. So uh, Gowers in 1881 uh, published that he got 70% of his patients seizure-free. Uh, I, in 2018, published that I got 64% seizure-free. So obviously, I'm not doing as well as he did. I think he probably didn't see focal seizures the way I saw them. So that's my only excuse for not doing as well uh, as he did in, in terms of overall seizure freedom. Next slide. So has the probability of achieving seizure freedom with anti-seizure drugs increased significantly in the last three decades? Regrettably, the answer is not by much anyway. Next slide. Okay, so what happens in drug-resistant epilepsy? And this is defined as failure of an adequate trial of two tolerated, appropriately chosen and used anti-epileptic drug schedules, whether it's monotherapy or in combination to achieve sustained seizure freedom. I think everybody knows that. That's the ILAE Commission on Therapeutic Strategies, which I was a part, and Patrick Kwan, my co-author, was the first author. Next slide. So what we're going to talk about just in the last few minutes is uh, surgery. How are we doing with that? What sort of devices can we use? Uh, <coughs> neurostimulation techniques. Just a little bit of information on where we, where we are with with the non-pharmacological options to treating the epilepsy. Next slide. So surgery uh, is the first thing, and, uh, and this was the first, um, uh, I think about 20 years ago, we started to realize just how much we could do for the right patients with, uh, with, with, uh, with respect to surgery. Next slide. So there are a few, double, a few good studies. This was the first one from Sam Weeb uh, from Canada. Uh, and uh, surgery, 58% seizure-free, uh, medication, continuing medication, 8% seizure-free. Uh, and this was uh, a randomized controlled trial. 
uh, patients had um, 21 years of epilepsy, as I mean, uh, before they got surgery. Now we would hope they would get surgery a lot sooner than uh, having refractory epilepsy for 21 years. Next slide. This is a, 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 a P. Dengel's randomized trial, which he had difficulty completing, but 11 of 15 seizure-free patients in the surgical group were seizure-free for two years, and none in the medical group. Uh, and this is early surgery versus drug therapy in, in, in randomized trials. And all 38 patients had mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Next slide. This is a, a study, a pediatric study from India, uh, appropriate surgery 57%, medical therapy only, sorry, 57 patients, medical therapy only 59 patients. Uh, primary outcome was seizure freedom for 12 months. Next slide. And again, as you would expect, since they were selected patients, the surgery group probability of seizure freedom was over 50% and very, virtually nobody in the, uh, no kids in the medical therapy group were seizure free. So the data, not surprisingly, do support uh, epilepsy surgery and um, trials arguably, certainly for this population of patients aren't, aren't needed anymore. I think we've proved it, uh, that surgery is, is, is the best way forward. Next slide. So in the meta-analysis, 72% with lesional epilepsy were seizure free. 36% in non-lesional epilepsy in adults, very similar number, 74% seizure-free in children, 45% seizure-free in, in, in non-lesional epilepsy. Again, we can't do anything like that with the medication, and so uh, this is important uh, data. 35 studies involving more than 2,800 patients with lesional and epilepsy and 60, 697 patients with non-lesional epilepsy. So surgery, as we know, has a big part to play in some patients, not a huge number, but it makes a big difference in the ones that it does help. Next slide. Okay, the prognostic factors associated with better, surgi better surgical outcomes um, include uh, abnormal MRI, complete reception, mesial temporal sclerosis, concordance of MRI and EEG findings, um, absence of cortical dysplasia, and obviously the presence of tumors, which you can remove. Next slide. I'm now just gonna mention uh, some of these other techniques. Vega nerve stimulation, uh, a number of devices that are available. Next slide. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, there are many people interested in that. Uh, next slide. But if you look at the long-term outcome, very few patients attain long-term seizure freedom with these techniques. So neurostimulation offers non-pharmacological strategies to improve seizure control for patients with pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Vegas nerve stimulation and response neurostimulation has shown limited efficacy in randomized controlled trials and controlled data from prospective studies and need to confirm reports of advantages regarding cognitive tolerability and CDEP risk, which are claimed. So there's a lot we don't know about these te techniques, but they are no uh, they do not cure epilepsy and they don't always make people seizure free. In fact, they don't make many people seizure free. Next slide. Okay, um, this is just a few words about uh, implanting electrodes in the anterior nucleus of, of thalamus. Um, Bob Fisher, who does a lot of this work, uh, lent me these slides. Next slide. And in the, in the randomized studies, the Patients who do get the device switched on do better than those who get the device not switched on, if you like. But it's not great, and, and very few of them are seizure-free. They do tend to continue to do a bit better over many, many years. But seizure freedom, of course, is the main goal, and very few patients are seizure-free. And this is invasive and expensive. Next. So deep brain stimulation of thalamus reduces numbers and severities of seizures by about a third and two to by, by two to five years after, after the device. About 15% become seizure free, but not many and it's not a cure. Side effects are not, uh, not a big deal, but there is a small chance of surgical complications. Uh, the patients don't feel the stimulation and there are no medication like side effects. And there's still a lot of work to be done before we can find out who will benefit and how to make the stimulation uh, more effective. Next slide. So to conclude, <clears throat> I've shown you the data for the drugs, which are 
and change, but at least we get round about two thirds of people seizure free. Surgery is probably underutilized and it can make many patients seizure free uh, and some of them, of course, off medication. And, and this is a, a, a technology and, and this is a treatment that we should uh, see more uh, adopted throughout the world. Neurostimulation is usually a palliative procedure, but it can be useful in selected patients and, and research is, much research is needed. And there is many more to come. Uh, this is just a summary of where we are at the moment. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll pass you on to Bruce Levin to continue the, <coughs> the, the, the program. Well, thank you, Martin. And uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, this presentation and it was extremely informative. Um, and it, it really brings us up to date in, in, in terms of what the thinking is with regard to uh, management of, of people with epilepsy. Uh, before I do proceed, I, I, I wanted to ask a few questions. There were some very uh, good questions that came up. And um, one, uh, one that came up was, uh, I, I guess, that uh, given uh, the polypharmacology uh, uh, that is often required in, in managing patients uh, who have epilepsy, um, in the selection of drugs, uh, are, are you noticing that the newer drugs have uh, lesser or, more, or less serious side effects than the older drugs? Or uh, as you alluded to, there really wasn't any big difference, but are, are you noticing any difference in the newer drugs with regard to uh, uh, side effects and, and safety? The, the, difference, the differences uh, depend on, on the drugs. They do have different side effects, but you know, if you have a rash, is that worse than Having, uh, having depression or psychosis with, uh, with uh, uh, levetiracetam is it, it, not really comparable as such. And what I showed you was a population uh, analysis. If I went for individual patient, I would focus down on the, on the individual drugs. For some, one drug is good and for another, that's not a good drug for them. Uh, <clears throat> you can use phenobarbital in low dose and get very good results if you're careful. Um, you can use levetiracetam and get a lot of people with psychosis that are, uh, and depression uh, that are not recognized. So it's a different lecture, really. And what, what I did today was look at the, po the population rather than the individual patient. And I'd be yeah. happy to come back and, and, and do that, uh, that lecture too for you. Well, we'll make that opportunity, no doubt. Uh, one, one last question, and that is that, um, and, and these two I'll try and incorporate it as to one. And that is uh, perhaps uh, given the, uh, the number of failures that a, a patient may uh, experience and the number of drugs that, that have to be added or changed, um, is, is there any relationship between uh, the number of drugs and failures and the onset or, or the risk of SUDEP? Um, and uh, how many failures are, must you see with medications before you start thinking of surgical interventions? I think as far as surgical intervention, two failures um, will do it if you've got a lesion to, to, to remove. Um, uh, SUDEP um, uh, is, is a complicated uh, scenario. Clearly, the more, the more seizures you have, the more you're at risk. But some people just get three seizures and then they die of SUDEP. So we, we, it's, again, it, it's a very complex scenario. But clearly, um, tonic-clonic seizures, Seizures in bed at night, these are the risks. Um, and uh, even if you could get, if you can stop these, them and the, the patient has a few focal seizures uh, a month, then they're much less likely to die of SUDEP. So uh, as I say, every scenario needs its own analysis and its own solution. Uh, and they, again, there's a lot of data in the literature uh, that, that you can look at and, uh, and that will help you in, in, uh, in terms of the population. But will it help you with that individual patient? That's a much more difficult scenario. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Brody. And we're going to shift gears a little bit now as, as uh, Professor Brody has discussed uh, and brought you uh, really up to date and as to the current state of the art in the management of, of people with epilepsy. Um, we're, we're going to take it now from the state of the art to the uh, evolution and the way we engage with patients and how we see that dynamic changing. And in particular, how we use uh, technology and, uh, 
an opportunity, uh, opportunity in the uh, healthcare landscape uh, to help address the needs of uh, people with epilepsy and, uh, and to be able to provide a service. If there's one thing that has been made clear, certainly in Professor Brody's uh, talk, that is that the, the patient-physician engagement and dynamic is extremely important. Um, it, it's necessary to evaluate how the patient is responding to therapy, but more importantly, it's, it's important to assess the patient and even diagnose whether they have epilepsy. So I think that uh, taking a, a step backwards now from that state of the art and, and to share a perspective of what the status is of epilepsy and what are the challenges around the world. Um, a lot of this information has come from the World Health Organization and I know Professor Brody and, uh, and his team of colleagues have done an extensive amount of work uh, with the World Health Organization in, in truly establishing uh, the case and the, and the fight against epilepsy from a global perspective. Uh, we know that there's in excess of 50 million people worldwide that suffer from epilepsy. But the interesting fact is that 80% of these people live in low and middle income countries or uh, areas of limited resources, uh, which may be rural areas or even in the inner cities where access to a specialist uh, may not be quite as easy as one would think. Each year we see about 5 million people diagnosed with uh, epilepsy. Uh, but the, uh, the incidence varies uh, depending on region. And in uh, most of the higher income and I would say resource rich areas, um, we see a rate of about 49 per 100,000 people that are diagnosed with epilepsy per year. But in those areas where resources are limited uh, and in the lower and middle income areas, uh, we see the figure can be as high as 139 cases per 100,000. Well, why the difference? Uh, I think a lot of it may, may be due to the regions that uh, the patients live in, and certainly in the low and middle income areas where we see the more rural areas, there are infectious causes. There are causes that are related to the intrinsic care that's available in, in healthcare. Uh, it may be preventative health measures, uh, and, uh, fetal, uh, fetal health, but also a lack of accessible care and, uh, and overburdened uh, uh, resources that make it more difficult for people to receive the care that may in, in fact identify phenomena and that could prevent the onset of, uh, of seizures or epilepsy. Uh, I think the last point that I wanna stress is if we look at it worldwide, three quarters of the population of people with epilepsy uh, live in areas where there are limited uh, resources and they fail to get the treatment that they need in a, in a timely manner. Now, if we look at the entire world, um, you, you can see an interesting distribution here. And that is where you look at the, the uh, active epilepsy rate, uh, uh, at least as defined by the WHO, you see it mostly in the Southern hemisphere, but also in uh, uh, predominantly in the Western hemisphere as well. Um, areas of, uh, of limited resources, again, in rural areas or lower middle income areas. And if you look at the prevalence, the prevalence is, is much higher in the Western hemisphere, but also if you look at the Southern hemisphere, it's, it's fairly high as well. Now, when you look at uh, surgically treatable epilepsy, and these are the cases as Martin uh, Brody, uh, Professor Brody has alluded to, are, are the cases that are generally refractory or not responsive to care uh, and the, uh, the, the standard treatment, we, we see a, a larger rate of surgical cases occurring uh, in uh, certainly in the uh, uh, lower half of the world, uh, in uh, some of the areas where uh, there is difficulty in access between the patient and the physician and therefore perhaps a higher rate of uh, drug failure or refractory cases. Now, what uh, Professor Brody said in, in a very eloquent and simplistic way, I'm only gonna make much more complicated by showing this, uh, uh, this diagram of what is the typical patient journey uh, that an individual with uh, epilepsy may face given the current standard of care. And it really depends on uh, how the uh, event presents itself uh, whether it's a convulsive seizure or a focal seizure that may be non-convulsive, it will determine uh, whether they're actually uh, uh, 
witnessed or uh, referred to a hospital, uh, or in fact, it's an event that uh, has no uh, immediate diagnostic uh, label to it, and it may just be that the patient is behaving in a different manner or maybe responding in a different manner. And in this case, without the proper medical intervention, uh, this phenomenon may go unnoticed and undiagnosed for an excessive period of time. And generally, if you look at the pathway that a patient would follow from the point that an event occurs to the point where they are successfully treated, it could take as long as four years. Um, and the, the reason for this uh, length of time may be certainly, as uh, Professor Brody alluded to, is that it, it may not be uh, the appropriate uh, choice of drug, or in fact, they may be drug resistant uh, so that they are not responding. But if you look at the left-hand side of, of this journey, uh, it may be that there was a significant delay from the time that an individual had the event until they were successfully diagnosed and placed on an appropriate form of therapy. So how do we deal with this, this challenge? How do we ensure that patients can, in fact, be identified, be assessed, and be managed in a much more timely manner to shorten that four-year time span to a matter of weeks or months? Well, in looking at the assessment that uh, come directly from people with epilepsy and, and what their uh, dilemma is, um, certainly no doubt a lack of access, but inherent with the epilepsy itself uh, lies a tremendous stigma and so social burden. Uh, many individuals who are uh, uh, afflicted with uh, seizures and have epilepsy uh, may, want, may not want to be disclosed publicly. They may avoid or resist going to a physician for fear that they will achieve this diagnosis. And we know in certain countries, in certain populations, in certain, certain cultural groups, there is a tremendous stigma placed on individuals who are diagnosed with epilepsy. Uh, they are forbidden uh, uh, to take uh, certain forms of employment. They may be outcasts when it comes to going to school. Uh, many are forbidden to getting married. So therefore, there is a strong disincentive to publicly be acknowledged and to go seek care. So a way that they can be seen by their physician in a more private way will certainly uh, encourage more individuals to be seen and to be diagnosed. There's also a lack of awareness of, of the disease. There's barriers in the physician-patient relationship, primarily in, in access or the lack of availability of of trained specialists. And clearly it leaves the individual with multiple questions and dilemmas. And that is, uh, what is this phenomenon that they're faced with? What is the disease? What is the prognosis? Where can I find reliable information uh, other than going online if they even have that capability? Uh, are there people like me as well? And we're finding that uh, we now are able to provide digital solutions. And that is we can remotely connect individuals so that they can see the, the right and appropriate individual, so that they can receive the right and appropriate information. Because again, as Professor Brody said, the, the choice of the right drug is important, and we all agree is the right drug is the drug that works, uh, but ultimately it's to try in any way possible to get a higher percentage of patients becoming seizure free. So if we look at the evolution of medical care uh, in general and how that could potentially impact the, the management of people with epilepsy, let's go through time and see how healthcare has evolved. Uh, and this is in the absence of technology. It is really focused on, uh, on individual preference, pre uh, preference but also um, the, the state of affairs in the uh, healthcare environment. Uh, Traditionally, uh, from the 1800s through the 1900s, uh, uh, patients would see their physician through home visits. The physician would have their bag and they would go to the patient's home and they would see the patient and they would manage the patient in, in their entirety. They would be the generalist, but they would also be the specialist and they see the patient uh, in the comfort of their home and privacy. As we got into the later part of the 1900s and 1940s through the 1960s, uh, private practice, medical office practice became more popular so that the patient would actually go to the physician's office 
And this was actually becoming more popular during the 20s and 30s, in fact, of the 1900s. Then as we got into the 1970s and the 2000s, we started seeing the formation of specialized medical groups, multi-specialty practices, where you would have facilities that encompassed all of the specialists. And patients would be seen in a clinic or a hospital uh, that uh, specialized in that particular care. But now, given the technology and the fact that people are becoming uh, much more comfortable dealing with um, uh, information and knowledge and education and also interaction remotely, we started to see the uh, onset of uh, telemedicine. Now, telemedicine goes back to the 1990s. Uh, where people would get on the phone and speak to their physician. That really was a telephone consultation. But as we saw the, uh, uh, the explosion of computer technology and uh, the availability of, uh, of remote connection, uh, uh, patients and physicians started adopting that uh, means of engagement more readily. And in fact, we've not seen it uh, to this degree uh, until now, given the uh, COVID pandemic, where not only is it a matter of choice, but it's a matter of necessity, where patients, particularly those with uh, uh, labeled routine diagnostic needs, are not able to go to the hospital or go to the clinic because of the fear of, uh, of infection uh, and contamination or exposure to uh, COVID. So therefore, there's greater incentive and encouragement to see them remotely in a telemedicine type of environment. But there are other changes that are occurring in the environment that have really opened the door for virtual medicine. And uh, if we look at the ecosystem and the healthcare landscape, what we're seeing is, is really an explosion of biomedical sensors, uh, physiologic devices that are able to uh, assess diagnostically uh, physiologic uh, signs and symptoms that can be then digitally transmitted uh, over uh, great distances. And it's this technology that has made uh, medical intervention uh, much more successful remotely. We've also seen uh, a pressure towards cost containment uh, and needing to look at the appropriate medical treatment and evaluation focused on improving outcomes, not just treating a symptom or a disease, but actually having a favorable benefit on patient outcome. And, 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 and actually patient satisfaction, uh, which has become a key factor in value. We're also seeing new market entrance into the healthcare landscape. Um, we see uh, Apple, we see Google, we see even Walmart uh, and CVS and, and other players now that are playing a much greater role in uh, providing digital healthcare. And I think that that's not going to change. We're going to see companies and we're going to see media in industry as well, uh, who have specialized in the uh, digital distribution of information now getting into healthcare. If we look at the perspective of the patient, the patient is actually becoming a more active consumer of healthcare. They are becoming a decision maker. They're, they're the one who actually has control as to who they will see and when they will see just with the push of a button on their computer. Also, with the abundance of data, we are seeing now greater personalization of medical care. People are now starting to think of the management of diseases with an N of one, that being themselves. So how do we tailor the, the provision of healthcare? How do we tailor the delivery of healthcare to a specific patient? It can be done much more uh, realistically and, and much more easily remotely and digitally uh, uh, as a, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with a patient at the patient's time of their selection, wherever they may be. And patients are demanding transparency about their own medical care. They want to have access of their data. They want to be able to have a clear view of the availability of clinical trials and the data that is captured about them in clinical trials. And this is all being captured and distributed remotely and digitally. So it's that access that becomes important. And then finally, the private sector, the private sector being physicians, being the pharmaceutical industry, being device companies, shifting their focus on patient solutions that are, are now uh, more transactional. And that is dealing with patient value, dealing with patient need, and looking at patient outcomes over a broader span of time, as opposed to just treating the immediate illness. 
And also resources are becoming more available and can be brought closer to the patient, more convenient. So that a patient living in a rural area where there may be uh, fewer than one specialist per 100,000 people, and I would say that in, in a large abundant area, we may see anywhere from 2.5 to 3.5 trained epilepsy specialists per 100,000 people. But in a rural area, and certainly in low and middle income areas, we may be seeing zero to 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 per 100,000. So clearly not a sufficient number to, to be able to care for the needs of patients. And again, as Dr. Brody has alluded to, uh, there is a tremendous need to ensure that patient-physician engagement and interaction to ensure that they can ultimately become seizure-free. So again, now we start talking about the virtual delivery of care. What is a virtual clinic? Well, it really refers to the digital access of healthcare services through a remote clinical consultation. So unlike a telephone consultation where you call the physician up and you engage verbally, we're now talking about a digital platform where diagnoses can actually be obtained while the patient is at home or in a remote center. And it can then be transmitted real time to the specialist any place in the world, whether they be in Atlanta or in Glasgow. Uh, most importantly is what we're doing is we're using this technology to move diagnostic processes out of the hospital or the epilepsy center to the convenience of the patient home so that they can avoid stigma, they can avoid the, the public disclosure of their illness, but also can have access to a specialist who may not necessarily be available uh, in their close proximity. So we have all the right ingredients. We know that we have obstacles to patient access. We know that, that we are becoming aware of patient needs and that need to achieve seizure freedom. We know that the changing uh, engagement models are occurring. The patients want to be seen in a more convenient way. We also know that uh, we are achieving greater experience with remote diagnostic services. So how do we put this all together? We can do so through a virtual clinic. And again, delivering our remote diagnostic services to a patient from a distance. And certainly epilepsy, and in particular, the, the diagnosis of epilepsy through traditional EEGs and other uh, digital uh, encounters can now be rendered rather simply through the virtual clinic. So if you look through the, the typical steps that a patient may follow now in a virtual clinic is they may have a seizure episode. And that seizure episode may be, for a first time, may be a convulsive episode, which may result in an ER visit or a hospitalization. That hospital may be in a rural center or it may be in a distant center where an epileptologist might not be available. However, the diagnostic services can be made available to that patient in that hospital, and it can be remotely interpreted by a specialist anywhere in the world. And after that interpretation, that individual can be sent subsequently to a healthcare provider and managed virtually through a hub, or they may be directly managed by the epilepsy specialist, and again, be done remotely uh, through digital technology, and there too, they can be managed through a virtual hub. And this could all be done through remote monitoring. And again, as I say, given the di digital technology that we have today with EEGs and with uh, cardiology and other um, electrophysiologic diagnostic uh, phenomenon, we can all do this remotely. So really, the steps that are taken are to, uh, to alleviate some of the unnecessary steps that are required or were once required in the traditional care pathway of a patient, where a patient would be seen by their primary care physician. They would then have to travel to a hospital or a specialty clinic where they would then see the specialist. Whereas now, through a virtual platform, that patient can be seen by a primary care physician who presumably is, is in a much more abundant supply, even in rural areas, or can be directly linked to a specialist through um, a virtual digital platform. The physician, the primary care physician, can actually also engage in a, an encounter directly with the specialist, also remotely. So all of this saves the patient time, saves the patient trouble, 
and it avoids the, the, the need for uh, distant travel, especially in areas where resources may be limited. So one of the solutions that we've addressed in BioSerenity, and certainly the concept that we have proposed and was published in, in a, a recent uh, article that was co-written by Professor Brody in uh, Epilepsy and Behavior, was the description of an epilepsy virtual clinic where the patient uh, may present with a symptom or a sign and may be subsequently prescribed a diagnostic procedure such as an EEG. That EEG then can be provided directly to the patient through either a technologist or through some other intermediary. The patient can obtain the EEG where the data can be remotely uploaded and sent either real time live or can be streamed or could be batch sent uh, through an upload to a specialist who can then interpret and read that EEG and make an assessment. And that EEG can be done either routinely as a 30 or 60 minute, or as we have uh, demonstrated and certainly our previous webinar has, has uh, emphasized the importance of long term ambulatory EEG which can also be done remotely. And it's through this long-term ambulatory EEG that we're able to provide important data that will help improve the yield of the diagnosis and perhaps can better enhance the diagnostic capabilities and allow this individual to perhaps um, assess whether the patient has epilepsy or not and can intervene either directly face-to-face -face or remotely. And again, this allows the patient to have the necessary engagement and encounter with the specialist uh, remotely and distantly. So what are the uh, benefits and the, uh, and, and the value messages that we get as a result of uh, implementing a, uh, a virtual uh, platform? And this is where we get to uh, the next step beyond the, the uh, standard of care to what benefits do we see in the future? And from the, the healthcare provider, we see enhanced and convenient access to the patient and the need to obtain real-time data and in the ability to make a real-time assessment. From the patient's perspective, we actually see more personalized concierge care, uh, which provides a, a, a greater degree of convenience and access. From the payer's perspective, is we're able to um, identify a serious disorder uh, and identify it in a much quicker period of time and avoid the necessary steps that could result in a higher cost delivery of care. Uh, it could avoid unnecessary interventions. As far as policymakers, we see a reduction in hospitalization and presumably a reduction in severity of illness. And as far as the new healthcare disruptors, the new uh, biotechs and technology companies that are coming in are seeing digital opportunities to better connect patients with specialists anywhere and any time. So finally, what we find and, and really the conclusion here as, uh, as providers and as um, uh, a healthcare industry and as a healthcare landscape, we either evolve or become irrelevant and extinct. And here are three clear uh, examples of um, deliveries of services that fail to keep up with the uh, growth of technology. And we have the, the steam locomotive. This one happened to have been uh, uh, built by uh, General Electric uh, locomotive. Now General Electric was very smart is they transitioned from locomotives to other technologies. And for that reason, General Electric still exists. This is a fax machine. Very few people are using fax machines these days. Everything is done by computer. The company is Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard has seen this and has progressed and is really a leader now in digital technology. And then lo and behold, the third company is Polaroid, uh, the provision of the instant uh, photograph, which really failed to keep up with digital technology and has become extinct. So we have the opportunity for our patients, and that is to embrace technology, address their needs, and to thrive and grow with the, uh, with the industry. And above all, to achieve the goal of making patients seizure-free, but by first ensuring that they have access to care uh, to provide the necessary diagnostic steps.
So thank you. And um, it's been a pleasure and uh, we really appreciate you joining this uh, webinar. Thank you, Dr. Lavin and Professor Brody. Um, Dr. Lavin, I, I do have uh, one question that came in for you. And before uh, telehealth uh, became the forefront um, recently of healthcare, um, how severe do you think that COVID impacted patients going to their doctor and subsequently not being uh, diagnosed or receiving treatment? So I will do a quick answer, but then I will defer to uh, Professor Brody, who's living it on a, on a daily basis. So my, my quick answer is it has had a significant impact. And that is the, the ability for a patient to go to the clinic, to the hospital, to receive a, an EEG or a follow-up EEG has been significantly impaired because hospitals have not been able to see patients for, as they say, routine healthcare follow-ups. Uh, also, physicians have had to uh, all but close down their practices because of the fear of uh, exposing potential patients to COVID. So I would say that both in terms of the ability to get follow-up, the ability to be diagnosed, and also the inherent fear that patients that uh, have had, uh, uh, not least of which individuals with epilepsy have had about themselves being exposed to COVID, I think have been significant and have, and have played a role. Uh, Professor Brody, would you like to comment as well? Uh, I mean, we've been, uh, and others have been um, pursuing the situation all around the world and uh, it's very difficult. To have people with epilepsy have a bad enough problem. Sometimes the seizures get worse because of the stress. They don't feel that they can access the care that they used to get. They get depressed uh, and, the, and the whole scenario is, as you expect, makes a, a bad situation even worse. Of course, it's very different in different countries and, uh, and in different scenarios in that country. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I don't think you need to be uh, an epilepsy specialist to realize what a bad scenario it is to have COVID in your back garden when you're still um, having seizures. So um, we, we're doing what we can uh, around the world, but it's very, very difficult. And of course, you could argue that's the same for many other conditions too. Sure. So actually, uh, um, Janice, I do see another question that came up. Uh, which I think is, is uh, very appropriate. And, and again, I'll answer and then I'll, I'll also defer to Professor Brody. And the question is, as far as the elderly population uh, and those who perhaps understand uh, the use of computers and smartphones, per, uh, perhaps a little less. Um, and I would also say in, in areas uh, that are resource limited, they may not have the, uh, the, the technical capabilities. Um, I still say that there is a role for the virtual clinic, even in, in this population, and it may not be directly benefiting the, the patient virtually, but it allows the individual to be seen by their, their local physician or, their, uh, or a local clinic. And it's that local clinic that can virtually connect with a specialist. So think of, of perhaps an elderly person being seen by their geriatric physician but their geriatric physician or their internist or their family care physician may be the only physician in that community and there may not be an epileptologist. But now that primary care physician could remotely connect with Professor Brody in Glasgow and get the appropriate guidance in terms of how to manage that individual. Yeah. Older people with epilepsy don't always or don't often see neurologists and epileptologists, they do see geriatricians and general practitioners. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do lectures, of course, on, on treatment of epilepsy in, in old age, and uh, it, it's actually easier. You do get more people seizure free. You use lower doses. The biggest issue is, is, is persuading and explaining to people what the problem is. And I always say, you know, seizures are a symptom of your, of your brain not being happy. I never use the E word for, for older people. They don't like it. Uh, and it, it, it's a different scenario. But nevertheless, many people can be seizure free. Very few of them have tonic clonic seizures. They have focal seizures. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that matters if you're, if you're living on your own and you're putting on the kettle and, and trying to make a cup of tea and you end up dropping it and scalding yourself. So this, this, the scenario is a little bit different. But as I say, most, I find mostly around the world, 
because it's such a common situation, because it's usually secondary to some other uh, problem, such as a vascular uh, disease, they do get seen by geriatricians, the GPs, and not by, by neurologists. So it's a slightly different scenario. And, and luckily, you know, you can get the seizures controlled in most of them. And the ones you can tend to have fairly limited episodes. So it, it's, it's a different scenario. Do they worry about it? Some do, some don't. And you know, often people who are older think, well, I'm get got to this age, I can live with this. And uh, younger people have a much more di difficult uh, situation because they not, may not get a job, they may not get married, as you rightly said. Uh, and they get divorced uh, in some parts of the world as soon as the diagnosis is made, it's just, they just get divorced and that's it. So there are many, many, many situations that affect people with epilepsy in different ways. And having access to, 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 to really good care and to knowledge and to experience is a huge thing because you know you can make the right decisions and make a big difference. I sometimes I, I, I sometimes get patients who come and see me and say um, uh, I've been privately because I don't see private patients and I, this happened and that happened and didn't work. But what you've done works. And why did why is that? Why did my, that other doctor say that? And I always say, well, you pay them, you ask them. So you need to know what you're doing, like everything else in, in life. But for epilepsy, it's very important that you see people uh, who know what they're doing. And that's exactly what you were discussing in terms of accessing the sort of quality. And it might take me five seconds to come to a, a decision and, and a treatment and explain to the patient, whereas you know, non-specialists might not know, and they might not be certain that they know what they should do. That's an advert for both of us. Right. I think so. I, I, I would say that to that point, and, and, and I guess it, how I would conclude is that if you look at that important statistic that of the, of the over 50 million people with epilepsy, only, you know, 80% of them uh, live in resource limited areas and three quarters of those don't even receive health care. Um, so the only way you can become seizure free is to be diagnosed. So the best drug is the drug that works, but it's no good if they don't get seen. And the drug, the drug that you can access. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavin and Professor Brody. Thank you also to all of the attendees for joining us today. Today's session uh, has been recorded and will be available to all participants. Be on the lookout for upcoming webinars brought to you uh, from BioSerenity. And I thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's been an honor. My pleasure.